All right, let's just have a word of prayer before we start. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you so much for this opportunity of coming to your throne of grace. And Lord, uh, as we do so, uh, we just want to ask humbly that you would uh, engage our minds and that you would embrace our hearts, that as we spend some time together this morning, that you would give us a glimpse of your character and your government, uh, the way you run your universe, and that it may la- uh, leave a lasting impression in our minds. We humbly ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. It was late afternoon and our travelling companions headed out in what would normally be a two to three hour journey. However, this day was no ordinary day. Often stopping, the journey was painfully slow as they trekked westward along the rolling countryside. Conversation was intense, confused, stressed as they recalled the emotional roller coaster of the past couple of days. Euphoric highs were shattered by excruciating lows, hollow, empty, confused, worried, full of doubt, with decimated hopes. So intense was their intention that they failed to discern the presence of a third party, an additional westward-bound traveller. It wasn't long before the apparent interloper interrupted them with a question. What on earth are you talking about? What on earth are you talking about? With stunned amazement, Cleopas turned to the pilgrim and asked, Seriously? Are you... Your ignorance is absolutely breathtaking. You must be the only person on the planet who has no idea what is going on. What things responded the stranger. We take the story up, the very familiar story up, continuing in Luke, if you've got your Bibles, Luke uh, 24 and verse 19. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women have amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning. Note that, early this morning. But they did not find a body. They came and told us that they'd seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as they'd said, but they did not see Jesus. And then he said to them, Seriously, your ignorance is breathtaking. Slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then to enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them, what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued as if he was going to go further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at at table with them, he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. At that point... Their eyes were opened and they recognised who their travelling companion really was. And he disappeared. He disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other and they said, Were not our hearts burning within us? Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us and opened the scriptures on the road? What did they do? They got up together and they at once returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them assembled together and they were saying, the eleven were saying, it's true, the Lord is risen and has appeared to Simon, that's Peter. And then the two told them what happened on the way to Emmaus and how Jesus was recognised to them when he broke bread. While they were still there talking, Jesus himself stood before them and said, peace be with you. A well-known story indeed. A well-known... Did you know that that is the single longest post-resurrection narrative in the gospel? The single longest post-resurrection narrative in the gospel. It must be important. Hmm? 
You think it's important? I think it's important. We need to give some context to the story. And that's what I'd like to do, just give some context to the story. And I, as we consider this story, let's just consider the week before this event took place. What happened to the disciples? What were they doing? What was that little embryonic church doing just before this event took place? Let's consider the week. On Sunday, the Sunday before, we had the triumphal entry. Just imagine, put yourself in the place of the disciples that, that week before. What was going through their minds? This is it. It's about to happen. It's going to happen. The triumphal... Monday, the cleansing of the temple... I mean, if you're thinking king, king of king, lord of lord, this is it, this is, this is when it's going to happen, this is, this is the time you're going to be thinking that, yeah? Cleansing of the temple. Tuesday, the cursed fig tree. Wednesday, the Olivet Discord. Thursday, the preparation for the Passover. Things are going well, and then the Last Supper takes place, and all of a sudden, things start, the wheels start falling off this machine, yeah? The wheels start falling off. Thursday, Friday, we have Gethsemane. We have the betrayal of the disciples. We have the disciples fleeing. Friday, we have the, the Jewish trials, including Peter's denial. Friday, we also have the Roman trials. Friday, crucifixion, Golgotha. Friday, burial. That's it. It's all finished, done and dusted. All that in a very short period of time. In five day days, their leader had been crucified, their two IC had betrayed them and capped himself, their three IC had publicly denied their leader and the rest of them had been decimated and destroyed. In five days, they had gone from hero to zero. That, that entire group had been absolutely decimated. Not to mention the uproar. I mean, Cleopas' own words... Jerusalem itself was in a complete uproar. This is the context of Road to Emmaus. This is the context of Road to Emmaus. So some questions. Some questions naturally come to me as I read this story and as I look at this. And this is what I wanted to share with you this morning. Um, why, was it, why was it that Jesus didn't reveal himself to them? He didn't reveal himself to them. Why? Why didn't he do that? What lessons was he trying to reveal? And perhaps, perhaps one of the better questions might be, why didn't they realise who it was? Why didn't they recognise him? Was it perhaps because they, were expect, they weren't expecting the suffering servant? Is that why they didn't recognise him? Now, the Bible does imply that there was some supernatural element involved, and I recognise that. But are there any other things that, uh, that, that may have been involved there? I think the key is in verse 27. And I think this is the key as to why Jesus maybe didn't reveal himself to them. In verse 27 of Luke 24, it says, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the, in the Scriptures concerning himself. That must have been some Bible study, yeah? That must have been a really, really great Bible study. And if you think about it, Beginning with the Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was in the, what the scriptures said concerning himself. The focus on the scriptures was the mission and work of, of Jesus himself. It was the restoration of the kingdom. It was a revelation of the resurrected Jesus himself. You know, at the end of the day, the Bible is all about Jesus. That's what the Bible's about. And you know something? Without the resurrection, the Bible makes no sense whatsoever. And in actual fact, the result of that Bible study was verse 32. Did not our hearts burn within us? Yeah? I have a question for you. When was the last time your heart burnt within you after you studied the Bible? Interesting thought. The Father sent the Son, the Son did the explaining, the Holy Spirit did the, align, did the enlightening and applying in their hearts. The result was the burning in the hearts of those people. That was the aha moment. That was the, it was the aha moment where, where their knowledge of the Scriptures, the, 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 the um, inspiration of the Holy Spirit and, and the actual revelation of Jesus himself standing in front of them. It was like the, boom, there's the paradigm shift. Boom, there it is right there. It's like, it all makes sense. It's real. Jesus is alive. And I think the thing is there, 
what Jesus was doing, instead of revealing himself to them, they would have accepted that. They would have absolutely 100% accepted that. What he was doing, he was pointing them to the scriptures. It was that divine, it was the divine stamp of approval on the scriptures themselves. Because the word of, the word of God in the flesh was being replaced by the word of God in the scriptures. That was what was taking place. You see, Jesus is not always going to be physically here with us. And so what was happening is the transference from the word of God in the flesh to the word of God in the scriptures. It's got to do with the, 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 the spirit working through the scriptures themselves. Confidence in the scriptures. And that is what was happening. Same thing happened to Paul on the road to Damascus. This is the, the, the authoritative mechanisms through which the um, salvation occurs. Through the church... Which what happened to Paul? When Jesus appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus, he didn't sit there and give him a, you know, a list of things. He said, no, you go to the church. You go and you spend time with Ananias. And what do you think, what do you think Paul was doing in those, that time he was sitting there and, um, before Ananias came? He was having that, that um, paradigm shift, that resurrected Jesus paradigm shift that just blew his mind in terms of the scriptures. All of a sudden it was like, Okay, in terms of the resurrection, if the resurrection is real, that means boom, 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 bang, paradigm shift. It's like, yes, okay, it will make sense now. Confidence in the authoritative mechanisms of salvation. That's, I think, why Jesus, or one of the main reasons why didn't Jesus didn't reveal himself to those disciples on that day. It was an important point. But there's a couple of other things in that story that I want to pull out as well. Under the circumstances, and that's the key, under the circumstances. Under the circumstances, why did those boys leave Jerusalem? You know what I'm saying? And the key is under the circumstances. In Luke 24, they say, In addition, some of the women have amazed us. They went to the tomb early in the morning, but they didn't find his body. And then they've turned around and said, They've seen a vision of angels that said he's alive. Then some of our, our people went to the tombs and found it empty, just as they said. Is it just me, or wouldn't natural curiosity have you say, hang on a second, time out here, fellas. Would the natural thing to do, if, if that happened to you, would the natural thing to do is, oh, well, let's leave. Is that what you'd do? It's like, why on earth did they leave? Seriously. Under those circumstances, what on earth was the reason that made them leave Jerusalem? You know, um, I don't want to be too hard on them because I think there was other things involved. But just looking at the evidence, you, you've just, you're just left and you're saying, why leave, guys? Why were you leaving Jerusalem under those circumstances? You know, some commentators suggest that they were lesser disciples and they were only in Jerusalem for the Passover. But the Bible is strangely silent on the reason for them leaving Jerusalem. Strangely silent. And... Um, Perhaps that's not the main point of the story. Perhaps the main point of the story, perhaps the main point of that, of that little narrative there is not the reason they left, but what Jesus did to get them back. Maybe that was the main point of the story. So that's that. Why did they leave Jerusalem? The other thing is, under the circumstances, and again, the, poi, the key point here is under the circumstances. Under the circumstances, why on earth did Jesus go to so much trouble to get them back? Under the circumstances. Think about it. He's appeared to Mary. Jesus has appeared to Mary. And remember what he said to Mary. He said, it says, don't touch me. But what it really means is don't continue delaying me. I haven't yet ascended to my father. He still had to go to heaven. He was still keen to get back to heaven to make sure that, it was, that the sacrifice, that his, his work had been complete and accepted. He still hadn't gone to heaven. You know, when Jesus cried, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani on the cross, he wasn't mucking around. Divinity separated for the first time ever. He'd been away from heaven for over 30 years. There was a party going to take place in heaven when he went back. And Psalms, I think Psalms 24 gives you that lift up the gates. Oh, yeah, you know, who is the king of glory? You get this whole thing in there. Imagine that. Jesus coming back into heaven after, after the cross. Imagine that. And under those circumstances, when Jesus is up there, he says, oh, time out. I need to get back. There's a couple of guys back there who are walking on the road to Emmaus 
and I need to spend some time walking with them for two hours. Do, does, does, is it just me? Does the, does the gravity of that sink in? The, 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 the post-resurrected Jesus needs to spend two hours walking with some people. He doesn't need to do that. And it's like, why did he do that? What was so important about those two boys that he went to that trouble to get them back to Jerusalem again? What was it? One thing is absolutely evident. Within this context of this story, despite the authority of scriptures, and I'm not denying that and I'm not belittling that, that's very important. Guess what? Sometimes you can read stories in scriptures and there's multiple important points out of it. Jesus wanted those boys back in Jerusalem. That is very evident. So as we look at this story, is there a possibility of looking at this from a broader perspective? Perhaps from an individual perspective, individually for us as individuals, and, and maybe from a broader perspective, from a church's perspective. You know, when you read through the Bible, when you read through the Bible, Jerusalem is important. Um, and Jerusalem is claimed as a spiritual, uh, as a spiritual uh, city for Islam, um, uh, Christianity and Juda uh, Judaism as well. And if you think about that and you read through it, um, it's a very significant place. And I, I guess the thing that makes it most significant is the fact that it actually represents the presence of God. Jerusalem in, in, in the Bible, from a, from, and it's that temple thing. In actual fact, did you know that according to Hebrew tradition, the Temple Mount is the actual site where, where God took the actual earth from which he formed Adam. If you go back and read in Genesis, it actually says that he, he took the man and placed him in the garden, which means he formed him elsewhere. Well, according to ancient Hebrew tradition, he formed him at the Temple Mount, which links salvation and the creation of man together at that mount, presence of God. Makes sense when you look at the image of God, the Omega Deo. It makes sense when you look at it from that perspective. So Jerusalem is significant. So as we look at that from a personal perspective, let's look at it from, from us. Um, as individuals, is there something in here we can get out of this? Sometimes we find ourselves drifting away from spiritual Jerusalem, yeah? I mean, it just happens sometimes. And we ourselves end up on a road to nowhere. Well, you know, Paul gives us some very good advice. And I, I really like this. Actually, I like it. This is from the message. Test yourselves. This is some great practical advice from Paul. Test yourselves to make your, sure you're solid in the faith. Don't drift along taking everything for granted. Give yourselves regular checkups. You need first-hand evidence, not mere hearsay, that Jesus is, Christ is in you. Test it out, out. If you fail this test, do something about it. And the great thing is, what do you do about it? Ask. That's all you need to do, is ask. What about from a corporate perspective? What do we do from a corporate perspective? You know, it's, um, it was the corporate perspective that really tickled my fancy, or at least got me interested in this particular passage. Um, you know... From a Protestant denomination's point of view, the Adventist church believes in what's called, and I'm going to get a little bit technical here, but bear with me. We believe in what's called historicism, where the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, we look at those prophecies and we see them as dealing with periods of time, um, uh, as, as periods of time starting with the time of, of Christ and going through to our time and beyond. And in the book of Revelation, in um, in, uh, as you're introduced to, to Revelation there, there's a period there where Jesus himself is walking, note that word, he's walking amongst the seven candlesticks and they represent seven churches. He's walking amongst the seven churches. What's he doing? He's walking. I think that's important. And if you look at those seven churches or those seven candlesticks, God or Jesus gives messages to each of those. And one of the messages to our church is called the Laodicean message. That's the message he gives us to our church in particular. And there was one, and you've got to bear with me for this here. There's a reason why I'm going down this, this particular path, because it relates to the Road to Emmaus story. And it was surprising when I first saw this. I thought, you're kidding me, that's amazing. This is the, the message to the Laodicean church, and this is the message Jesus has given us, our church for this day. Let's read what it says. And to the angel of the... Actually, most of you should know this. If you don't know it, read it. It's interesting. 
This is a message to us. The message uh, to the angel of the latest thing church, right? These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and the true witness. The ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. And so that because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spew out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich and have acquired much wealth and need of nothing. But don't you realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked? I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and, and white raiment or white clothes that you can cover your shameful nakedness and self to put on your eyes so that you can what? So that you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and chasten or discipline. Be earnest, or the old King James says, be zealous and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I am victorious, sit down with my father on his throne. Whoever has here has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, um, the church is, is often described um, in the Bible as, as a bride. And it's funny, when I, when I read that there, um, when I read that there, uh, if the church is supposed to be a bride, she's acting more like the flower girl, yeah? You know what I'm saying? Acting more like the flower girl. So why have I jumped from the road to Emmaus to the Laodicean message? Interesting, yeah? Why would I do that? Well, you might be surprised to know that, that there are a couple of parallels between the road to Emmaus story and the, the, the Laodicean message. There's a couple of parallels which surprised me, which really surprised me. Let's have a look at them here. Each, each parallel that I found was not necessarily significant by itself, but when you get them all together, it's like, hmm, maybe there's more to that than meets the eye. So I'm going to start off with my strongest point, yeah? If you're a lawyer, Stuart, you always start off with your stronger point, don't you? Start off with your strongest point. Well, I've said church... I've said that they're the church. I've said that these two boys going on the road to Emmaus is a church. Okay, weak point. Yep, I get it. The Bible does say where there are two or three are gathered, there I am also. So I'm going to use that one. So I think that's a valid point. There is a biblical principle for that. So I'm going to use that and take it as a, as a parallel. Yeah, okay, not the best point, but it's a parallel. Jesus walked with the churches. He walked with these guys. And I don't think that's insignificant. I think that's actually quite significant. There's not many times in the New Testament after the resurrection Jesus walked. It's actually quite important. You look at them every single time when Jesus walks after, that re after the resurrection. It's actually important. There's something important going on. The eye salve, latest in the latest in church, and their eyes were opened. To me, that's a, there's a parallel there. There's something going on there. He, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Fools, you fools, is that not a rebuke? If that's not a rebuke, what else is it? But he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. That's what he says. And that's what he was doing to those two boys. He loved them so much, he rebuked them. When it says in the latest in church, um, be zealous therefore and repent. Be zealous, it actually means be hot. Be hot like as in, ooh, heat up. It actually means be hot. Um, their hearts burned within them. Repent. Be, hell, be zealous, therefore, and repent. What does repent mean? Turn around. Yeah? Jesus, he says at the end of the later scene messages, I will sup with them. And the, and the supping is the word of God. Think of that in relation to the later scene message and what happened on that walk. The word of God. The supping. I will come to him and he will come. And, and, he will, and that's actually new covenant language. Uh, Rodimaeus, he eats bread with them. And then lukewarm. Would you be surprised to know? Would you be surprised to know that uh, the word Emmaus in Semitic means warm springs? Would you be surprised to know? So why the parallels? Why are those parallels exist? You know, I think that the lay I think that the, the road to Emmaus is, is a another perspective into the Laodicean message. It's another door through which we can view that. 
I think there's more thought that can be put into that. However, one point that's certainly clear for me and one point that really is important. Consider the length that Jesus went through to get those boys back. That, I think, is one point that we want to get through. Is it possible that if Jesus' prognosis of the Laodicean church is, this, is correct, if, if it's correct, is it possible that he'd go to the same lengths for us as a people today? Is it possible that he'd go to the same lengths for us as individuals today? And, I, and as I look at that there, I think to myself, um, I, I just see glimpses of, of the lost coin. I see glimpses of the, the prodigal son. I, I see glimpses of the lost sheep, all sort of tucked within that. Perhaps it might be worth looking at the Laodicean message from the perspective of the road to Emmaus, that road to nowhere. After midnight on the evening of March 8, 2014, Malaysian Airways flight 370 taxis out the runway 32R at Kuala Lumpur International Airport. It's a balmy evening and things are business as usual as the pilot pushes forward the throttle on those two Rolls-Royce Trent 800 engines and just eases that throttle, throttle forward and those two uh, engines which are capable of producing 400 kilonewtons of, 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 of thrust just push that vehicle forward and the passengers in the seat just get pressed back into that into their seats as that thing lurches forward down the runway. Not too long, it reaches V1, and then all of a sudden, the magic of physics takes place over the, those big wings, and that majestic bird reaches, starts to rotate, and that, that nose wheel just lifts off the ground, and she starts soaring into the air, heading, heading northwards up towards Beijing, eventually reaching its cruising Cruising altitude, flight level 31, 31,000 feet as it starts cruising up towards Beijing. At around 38 minutes into the flight, uh, the Area Control Centre at Kuala Lumpur uh, instructs the flight crew to hand over to Ho Chi Minh City Air Control. Captain replies from MH370, Good night, Malaysian 370. Two minutes later, the flight disappears from the radar in the, uh, the air traffic controller. The little, the little icon boom, just disappears, which means that the uh, aircraft's transponder, which is the secondary radar, is no longer functioning. And so commences, arguably, one of the greatest mysteries in aviation history. <laughs> um, we know sort of what happened after that. You see, after the train, plane's trans, uh, ponder stopped working, uh, military aircraft tracked the plane. And what it did was quite unusual. It did, it did a very sharp bank. Immediately afterwards, about two minutes after that, the transponder stopped working, it banked sharp to the, to the, to the left or to the port side uh, at 40 degrees. Uh, 40 degrees is 10 degrees more than is allowable in commercial airlines. 40 degrees is going to sit you back in the seat and make you feel quite uncomfortable. Passengers on that plane would have known that they were turning around. Uh, it then headed down south towards the island of Penang, and as it got to the island of Penang, just south of Malaysia there, it swung around and headed up the Malaita uh, Strait up towards the, um, out towards the Indian Ocean. Um, and just as it got to the southern tip of the island there, the uh, first lieutenant's um, uh, cell phone actually registered with one of the towers down on the ground. Um, and as it started going out towards the ocean there, uh, it started reaching the, the limits of the military aircraft, or the military's uh, radar. This is primary radar, so that's the, that's the repeater one, you know, the ping one. It, it started reaching the limits, and, um, and uh, it, it just left. Couldn't see it anymore. And at that stage, um, something uh, happened. The onboard satellite data unit, there's, there's, each plane has something on board, which is a satellite system was a link and it kept pinging. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. And they actually worked out simply by working out how long it took for the send and receive to take. And they worked out pretty well, quite accurately, where it was going until it got the last one. And as a result of that, they sort of knew where the last one was and they sort of knew where they could possibly look for that aircraft. 
It was heading in a southwesterly direction down into the vast, empty, void, which is the southern Indian Ocean. Someone on that plane sent that thing down on a road to nowhere. To this day, it remains the most expensive aviation search in history, and it still hasn't been found. Whoever put that plane on a road to nowhere did a good job. You know, the problem with being on a road to nowhere, regardless of who you are, whether you are an individual, a group, or a plane, it doesn't end well. It doesn't end well. And I think the reason why Jesus went to so much trouble with those two boys on the road to Emmaus was to give them an experience. You see, the only way to get them back to Jerusalem was an encounter with Jesus. That was the only way those boys were going to get back to Jerusalem, an encounter with Jesus. So if, if you're on a road to nowhere, drifting spiritually, you need an encounter with Jesus. Think of the trouble Jesus went to with those two boys. He'll do the same for you. <laughs> Isn't that great? And in relation to the Laodicean church, you know, um, we know how that ends. The Laodicean church is going to own that message. It will own that message. The flower girl is going to grow up and become the bride. She is the church triumphant. We know how that ends. Which brings us to the final point, which is really the, 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 really the, the focal point. Whatever reason we have for being on the road to nowhere, whatever reason it is for being on that road to nowhere, in the end, it is not good enough to keep us there after an encounter with Jesus. Let's just have a word of prayer to close. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you so much for the many blessings that you give us, Lord. We just thank you for your commitment to us as a people and uh, just your Holy Spirit you send. I just thank you for the many uh, ways in which you lead us, Lord. I just pray that you'd help us to keep our eyes focused on you. Guide us now as we head into the uh, Sabbath school program. I just ask for a continued blessing and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.